Hi, I'm going to be going through all the National Chemistry Olympia exam from 2018. I uh, just took the test and now I'm going to go through what the answers are, how I got them, or how I ended up getting them eventually. The test itself is very hard and it would probably be best if you worked it out first because I'm going to go through these as quickly as possible since there's 60 questions to go through. Uh, and the first one here, we have a manganese oxide compound. We're adding stream hydrogens. We're going to make water into manganese metal. So it tells us that there's 0.688 grams of whatever the manganese and oxygen compound is. And then it tells us how much water is produced. So we're starting with the 0.235 grams of water. I'm going to change that into moles. Dividing by 18.02 comes out to 0.013 moles of H2O, which is also the amount of moles of oxygen. So we can go back and we can say, okay, we now know how many moles of oxygen are present in here. And we can turn that into grams to figure out how many of the grams here are composed of oxygen and how many are composed of the manganese. So if we take this and put that in the grams, it comes out to 0 0.20, 0 0.209 grams of oxygen, which means that the remainder of this is the grams of manganese. So that's 0.479 grams of manganese. And that comes out to be 0 0.0087 moles of MN. We have the moles of manganese and we have the moles of oxygen. So by taking a ratio between them, we find that this is 1.5 times larger than this. It means that we have one of these for every one and a half of those. And that takes us to choice, I'm sorry, not choice B, choice B, which is MN203. Second question, we don't need to do any calculations, so whenever possible you want to work quickly on these tests. Uh, here, it just says you have one gram of any of these four things, which one would have the largest number of molecules, so all you want for that is which one has the smallest molar mass, or which particle is the smallest. So if we look, uh, Buckminster fullerene is 60 carbon atoms, that's going to be a tremendously large molar mass. Um, sulfur with eight sulfurs is going to be quite large, so we're really choosing between these two. Oxygen is 16. We have three oxygens per, for AMUs per atom, uh, whereas phosphorus is around 31, it's 30.97. But anyway, long story short, 48 compared to 124, so we use our choice there. And that one we can scoop through quite quickly. Uh, three is also pretty simple. So in three, we're looking at the reaction of nitrogen plus hydrogen turning into ammonia. Nothing to indicate anything here about equilibrium. Instead, we're to assume a stoichiometry type problem at the beginning of the test, and there's nothing in here to contradict that. So it says that we have five liters of nitrogen gas react. It produces 10 liters of ammonia. Those two numbers match, which again complements the fact that we're not looking at equilibrium analysis. Wants to know what the minimum volume of hydrogen gas is required. It's just going to be three times that amount, and so we can skip straight to it, and that's good. Uh, you can go through and convert things into moles and do all of that, but really as long as the temperatures and volumes are consistent, then your, your liters are going to be proportional in the same way that moles are for gases, or for ideal gases. Okay, so scooting along. Uh, this one's a little bit tougher, so here it says we have equal masses of the two, these two things with an excess of all those, so we're going to ignore all of those. And what that means is that one of those is going to be limiting and one of those is going to be in excess. And we need to figure out which is which. And then it tells us that we produce 1,000 kilograms of phosphoric acid. Now, if we look at the answers here, these are also in kilograms. So really what you can do is you can just get rid of those kilos and just do everything in grams. Because if 10 kilograms of this makes 10 kilograms of that, then 10 grams of that will make 10 grams as well. So we can skip over the kilo if you want can go through and do it as well. Uh, I skipped over it. So we have a thousand grams of phosphoric acid. We need to kind of start there. So that's something we know. And if we go ahead and change that into moles, that comes out to be 10.2 moles of phosphoric acid. So if we work backwards then, we know that there's two of these produced for every one of those. So that means we're going to have 5.1 moles of calcium phosphate. And that means that we would have 15.3 moles of the silicon dioxide, or whatever they call it in this particular problem. Um, silicon, I think? Silicon, yep. 
So I'm going to go through it then, and I'm going to change those into grams. So 15.3 turns out to be 918 grams of the silica, and the 10.2 ends up being about 1,580. I'm multiplying by the different molar masses. Now, if we had equal masses, and it was 918 apiece, we would not have enough of this to create that much phosphoric acid. So we must have the larger of the two amounts, which means that we will have this much of the two chemicals, and B will be So for number five here, uh, what we're going to be looking at is that we have a two sets of solutions reacting. The key in this is identifying that not only do we have to do some dilution analysis and things like that, but the big thing is that we're forming this precipitate, and we need two of those for every one of those. So if we do 0.03 liters for the calcium times 0.3 molar, that will give us our moles. It's going to be 0.00. .00 9 moles of CO2 plus. If you look, the exact same calculation with different numbers, we have half the volume but twice the concentration for fluoride, so we're also going to have 0 0.009 moles of fluoride. So what's going to happen is all of this is going to precipitate out because one of those needs two of those. So since we have equal amounts, we're going to have half of this remaining. So we're going to have 0 0.0045 moles of calcium ions left over. We'll have no fluoride. So we know that 2 is not a correct choice. Okay. From there, we actually need to do an evaluation to see if this is 0.1 molar. So to do that, we divide that by the sum of the two volumes, which is 45 milliliters or 0 0.045 liters of solution. So if we do that divided by that, we come out to exactly 0.1, which means that 1 is correct and 2 is not. Okay, this one, I'm not 100% sure on the exact way to solve it. So what I did was I thought, okay, well, what different possible things could this be? This could be sulfite, this could be sulfate, this could be thiosulfate, or this could be whatever the S406, uh, I'm not even sure what the name of that is. So all of these, I believe, have two minus charge, which fits with our sodium so from there what I did was I went through and I originally figured out, I started here and I figured out whether this worked or not. Uh, and I found that I didn't, so I shifted towards this. And then I actually went through and tried doing an evaluation. So here's what I eventually found. Was I, I went through and said, okay, let's assume it's Na2SO4. And so what were the mass of these pieces? So if I have two sodiums, that's going to be 46 AMUs, give or take. And then the sulfur there would be 32. And I thought, well, even without the oxygens there, that clearly can't work because if this is that much smaller than this, then I don't have 50% sulfur. So then I went through and I checked this. I checked for Na2S4O6, and I went through and did a percent mass of what the sulfur would be for that. So I did 32 times 4 plus 6 oxygens plus 2 sodiums, and then I divided the 4 sulfurs by that, uh, and that came out to be exactly correct. So I went so I'm not sure if there's a way that you can figure out both unknowns simultaneously while only knowing one percentage and without knowing the ratio of any of those things. Maybe you can make an assumption to start that and get it rolling. I just found that for this one, I think it was best if you knew what all the possibilities were. All right, this one I thought was really, really difficult. I did not get this one right the first time through. So here's what I think is the explanation on what it's supposed to be. So we're looking at which one is diamagnetic. So we're looking for a case where we have all of our electrons paired. But I think beyond that, this is looking a little bit deeper. It's something else going on. So I went through and looked, and I, B was the correct choice. I thought, well, okay, well, how does that work? So here we have Fe, and this has a two plus charge. And we go through, so we have six negative one charges, four positive one charges, this must be two plus. So for iron 2 plus, we're looking at the 4s2 being removed, which leaves us with 3d6 remaining. And I thought, well, that's not diamagnetic unless we consider the fact that these are ligands. And so if that's the case, then we can get orbital splitting, where we end up with 6 like this, and then none on the top, and therefore it would be diamagnetic. So when we count for the ligand field splitting, then this works. So then I went through and looked at this, because here the cobalt is 3 plus. 
And that would also imply a 3D6 notation because we would move the 4S2 and we would go from 3D7 to 3D6. But the difference is, is that this one only has four ligands, which means that it's more likely to have this 3D splitting. And then if we put in our six electrons, we end up with two unpaired electrons up here. I, I'm not sure 100% that that's how we're supposed to figure this out, but that's the way that I came up with it, um, where it's actually functional. I don't really know what this is. Uh, and then this obviously would have no splitting because there's no ligands present. And so therefore we just have a regular ionic compound. Okay, this one I had a couple of issues with uh, in the sense that I felt like these could all probably be done without an indicator, this one would probably be the hardest, so I eliminated this, because you're not gonna easily tell by eye when a precipitate stops forming. But these two can be done without an indicator, um, because you can use the conductivity, perhaps, uh, with acetic acid, maybe. Uh, probably not, wouldn't, wouldn't work great, but it might be possible. Um, but the other one I thought you might be able to do is using uh, thermodynamics. So you could look at how much energy was released and then kind of figure out the maximal amount of energy released. But the reality is, is this one's going to just completely change color. So your best choice is A, even though it's potentially possible for B, C, and D to work in some fashion, um, the permanganate is going to go from the purple color to a light pink or colorless color in the acidic solution depending on what you mix with it. So that one obviously is going to not require an indicator. And then this one, I don't know how you would know this except to just know this, but here are the three different things that we're talking about here. So uh, the purple here is a mix of the blue and the pink shade of the cobalt. And the pink here is, um, which one? I believe it's the one with lots of water and very little chloride. But if I have lots of chloride, I get this blue color. And so cobalt is two plus, C was our choice there. Uh, manganese can form pink, it can form some other colors. This is more blue-green and this is typically colorless. So even if you didn't know that, you might've been able to eliminate a couple choices to get you close to it, but other than just knowing it, that's all I know. And then this one I thought was very difficult. Uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to know the answer to this. So the correct choice to this is C. So the nickel two plus is the most stable form of nickel. And so maybe you're supposed to know that that is, is kind of like, this is the less stable form, so this can't be the answer. Um, this doesn't precipitate, and you're not gonna obviously form nickel metal. And so maybe you can do that by just looking at the nickel. Uh, however, the copper one iodide is something that forms where the copper two combines with two iodides to make a complex. This undergoes disproportionation to form, or I'm sorry, not disproportionation. Uh, this actually undergoes reduction and this oxidizes to form the iodide uh, simultaneously. And when you end up forming this copper one, I don't know if you're supposed to know that because that's really getting into like a Frost Latimer diagram or a Bayes diagram that I'm not really familiar with. Um, that was the correct choice there.